All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made the heavens and earth and created the creation and who gave us faculties of hearing, seeing, perception and sensation and united us from different tribes and races to make us an ummah, one nation and gave us day and night in perfect alternation and created the sun and the moon in perpetual rotation and revealed to us the Qur'an guaranteeing its preservation and sent to us a prophet to be a paradigm of emulation and gave us our sharia to be a source of legislation and blessed us with the kalima as our solid foundation. He is the king of kings on the day of judgment and resurrection. May he send salat and salam upon our prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the owner of the praiseworthy station. Glory be to him for all that is in the heavens and earth bows to him in prostration. In the entire Quran, the main story that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us between haqq and batil, between justice and injustice, between tyranny and truth, is the story of Fir'aun and Musa. And in one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us a very interesting fact about this battle between good and evil, between justice and injustice. Allah says, إِنَّ فِرْعَوْنَ عَلَى فِي الْأَرْضِ وَجَعَلَ أَهْلَهَا شِيَعًا يَسْتَضْعِفُ طَائِفَةً مِنْهُمْ Verily, Fir'aun was a tyrant in the earth. Fir'aun was somebody who caused fitna and fasad in the earth. How and why? He divided his own people up. And he used one group against another. And he used one group to kill the innocents, to kill the children, to kill those that did not deserve to be killed. In the case of Fir'aun, he would kill their sons and he would leave their daughters. What an evil man he was. What a person who's causing fitna and fasad, who's causing tyranny and injustice. We understand this. The next verse, what is Allah saying? And we wanted to bless those that were being persecuted. Notice. These people are being killed. And Allah is saying, we had a plan. We had a reason why we did what we did. We wanted to give manna. Anna ala we had a plan that those people who were being persecuted, we wanted to change the paradigm. And we wanted to make them the ones in charge. And we wanted to bless them. And we wanted to make them the leaders in the earth after they were being persecuted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, and we wanted to show Fir'aun wa Haman wa Junoodahum ma minhum ma kanu yahdharun. We wanted to show Fir'aun and all of his armies that that which they feared the most was actually true and that they would be punished at the hands of the people they were being persecuted. This story is of course about Musa alayhi salam. And of course we saw the end of Fir'aun and we saw what happened to the followers of Musa. And in this story, there is wisdom for us for every single persecution, for every single tyranny, for every single injustice taking place. These days we are witnessing yet another rise of injustice. It is not the first in our lifetimes, in our likelihood, it will not be the last. But we see the rise of another fascist ideology, an ideology that is Fir'aunic, Pharaonic in its essence, an ideology that separates people based upon their race as Fir'aun did. This is exactly in the Quran. Ja'alahum Shia. He separated them up based upon their skin color, based upon their origin. This was Fir'aunic. And it is exactly what we see now in that land of India, that ancient land, a land that many of us in this audience have biological ties with, a land that is one of the bastions of human civilization, a land that has so much history in it. And yet we now see the rise of a new strand, a strand of intolerance, of bigotry, of injustice, a strand of an ideology that is preaching the purity of one race and one people over another. And this is not humanity. This is not not common sense and reason and logic. This is the essence of fascism. And the person that is in charge of this is following a methodology that inspired Fir'aun. This party in India, as we are aware, it is the same methodology that inspired Nazism. If you are not aware, you should learn this. The same ideology, its parent organization back in the 1920s was literally the ideology, not an exaggeration, that inspired the 
version of Hitler. And that is why Hitler took the swastika, which is an Indian symbol. He took it because it came from this ideology. And we see this ideology manifested in multiple movements across this globe. And I want everyone to be aware of three such movements. There are three primary movements that are having a similar ideology. And it is terrifying to see that they are on the rise. The first of them, which is what is going on in India, is the Hindutva, which is a radical strand of Hinduism. This is not mainstream Hinduism. Hindutva is a strand of Hinduism that says this land is only for one nation, one group, one ideology, and that is those who follow their version of Hinduism. By the way, their version, the same strand was the strand that assassinated Gandhi back when Gandhi was viewed to be the paragon of peace. They were the ones who assassinated Gandhi because they viewed Gandhi as being a betrayer, a traitor. Even though Gandhi was not a Muslim, he was a Hindu. But the version of Hinduism that he followed was not a version that the Hindu like. So that version is preaching one ideology supreme over all others. This is the first I want us to be aware of. Number two, it is of course one of the versions of, of this fascism understanding that we've been familiar with for the last 70 years. And that is of course the ideology of Zionism, which says that there's one race, one group for that land. And anyone who's not from that land does not belong there, even if they've been there for 2000 years. Hence somebody born into that version of an understanding, even if they're born in Europe or in America, they get automatic citizenship. And the people that are in that land, the Palestinians and others, whether they're Christian, whether they're Muslim, it doesn't matter. But because they're not a part of that ideology, they don't belong there. And the third strand is one that is right here, and that is white nationalism. And this is something we are seeing right now. This version of this fascism ideology where they want to shut down the borders. They're harping on immigration. They're banning Muslims and others from coming here. This white nationalism is linked to Hindutva and it is linked to Zionism. So don't be surprised when the leaders of all of these movements are shaking hands and cozying up because it is the same ideology even though ironically every ideology would not tolerate the others in their own land ironically the ideologies that are finding comfort and support at the dinner table in international festivals would not be comfortable eating dinner in the local neighborhoods that they live in because each one of them views the others as being false but these ideologies all preach the same version of bigotry and hatred that Fir'aun preached over 4,000 years ago. He divided his own people up into various races. One group would be the underguard. One group would be always killed, always massacred. One group would be the scapegoat. And the other group would be considered the dominant. They're the ones who are blaming everything on the other. And they're going and killing the other. And this is exactly what we are seeing in the land of India. This, the injustices in Palestine over 70 years. And unfortunately in this land as well, even though it's not that bad physically, but still, ideologically, this strand is on the rise. And dear Muslims, truth be told, the situation appears to be getting from bad to worse across this globe. Truth be told, subhanAllah, as the years go on, it seems as if things are happening. And those who study history, we are at a time frame now, which is very similar to 1915 before World War I. We ask Allah salam and afiyah. But the point is that we cannot be blind. We cannot shut our eyes. We cannot just ignore what is going on. Where this is happening, those people never thought it would happen. They never thought they would see the day where their own neighbors would come in and gang up on them, where their own peoples would come in the capital of this land of India, Delhi, which is supposed to be a bastion of civilization. It's supposed to be a land where there are police, there's government. This isn't some rural village. This is the capital. And we see what is happening in terms of ganging up, in terms of sectarianism, we do point out that this isn't just all people of one faith ganging up. There are righteous, just-minded people, even amongst the Sikhs and the Hindus. They are standing up and protecting. A number of them have lost their lives, protecting the honor and justice of Muslims and of their own country. And we thank them for that service and we hope more people join that. But that doesn't change the fact that these ideologies are on the rise across the globe. And what we should do as a response to all of this. First and foremost, dear brothers and sisters, 
do not be so complacent as to think that what is happening over there will never happen over here. How many times in the last decade have we seen these types of mini civil wars erupt out and really it appears the world is headed in a very dangerous direction. We ask Allah's peace and salama. Never ever feel complacent that what is happening over there will not happen anywhere else. Always turn to Allah for dua. Seek refuge in Allah from fitan. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ta'awwadu billahi min al-fitan. Seek refuge in Allah from all types of fitan. What is a fitan? A fitan is a civil war. A fitan is a disaster. A fitan is groups ganging up upon each other. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is reminding us as a part of our rituals, we should regularly seek Refuge in Allah from all types of fitan. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us a dua that, Oh Allah, if there's going to be a fitna, then allow me to return to you before that fitna comes amongst us. That, إِذَا أَرَدْتَ بِعِبَادِكَ فِتْنَةً فَقْبِدْنِ إِلَيْكَ غَيْرَ مَفْتُونَ To be in a fitna is a very dangerous thing. We don't want to be in a time of civil war and strife. It's a very dangerous thing. So we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We turn to Allah azza wa jal and we ask for Allah azza wa jal's protection. The second point of advice that we need to remind ourselves is that what is the purpose of a Fitna. Why does Allah Azza wa Jal send down these fitan? Allah tells us in the Quran, Alif la mim, a hasib and nasu and yutraku, and yakulu amanna wahum la yuftanun, wala kadafatan al ladina min kablihim, fala yalaman al lahu ladina sadaku, wala yalaman al kadibin. Alif la mim, did mankind think that they will be left alone? That they would not be tested? That all that Allah wanted was for them to say we believe? No, we tested the people before to see who was telling the truth and who was lying. The purpose of a fitna, The purpose of the fitna to separate the truthful from the false, to separate the righteous from the unrighteous, to show who truly believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala versus those who did not. So one of the main goals that we need to do, preparing ourselves for anything that might be happening is to strengthen our iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, Am hasibatum an tadkhulul jannah? Did you think you would enter jannah like that? Do you think jannah was for free? That all you needed to do was live a comfortable life and that's it? Am hasibatum an tadkhulul jannah? Wa lamma ya'lam illah. And Allah has not yet tested and seen. Allah has not yet seen amongst you those who are true versus those who are not. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, did you think you will enter jannah and you don't know of the stories of those before you? Masathumul ba'sa'u wa darra. They were rocked to the core from trials and tribulations. Ba'sa and darra. And ba'sa is civil war. And darra is pain and anguish and suffering and personal calamities. So Allah is saying the people before you, they tasted blood. The people before you, they had to see civil war. The people before you, they underwent trials of famines and plagues. They were shaken to the core. Until even the prophets and even the believers, they were wondering where is the help of Allah? For how long will we remain in this manner? And then Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ala inna nasr Allahi qareeb. Verily, the promise of Allah and help of Allah is close. Allah is reminding us that Jannah is not for free. Jannah is a high price. And you want the highest levels of Jannah, you have to pay a high price. And that price is what? Is to demonstrate to Allah that you are firm, you have sabr, you have iman. How can you demonstrate when there is nothing to show that sabr and to manifest that iman against? We don't want to be tested, dear Muslims. We don't want to be tested. But if the test comes, we have to know how to pass the test. We ask Allah for His protection. We ask Allah that, oh Allah, remove any test from us. But if the test comes down, this means Allah has chosen us to raise our ranks. Because those who are tested and pass the test will have a much higher place than those who are not tested. And this is the beauty of our faith. Our Prophet Wasallam said, don't desire to meet the enemy. Don't desire to be foolish and say, I can do it. You don't know what you can do when you are faced with these calamities. You don't know how strong your iman will be when these issues come. 
Don't be foolish and say, I can do it. No. Don't desire to meet the enemy. But if the enemy comes and you are there, then uthbutu, be firm and be patient. This is our philosophy. This is our ideology. We do not want to be tested. We ask Allah's protection. We ask Allah to protect ourselves and our families. But we need to be prepared. And in case we are tested, then we need to show our firmness and our resolve. And that will be done by our Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Iman has to be strong. And especially dear Muslims, before the fitan come, our Iman has to be made strong. Because when the, if a fitna were to come, if a trial were to come, it's too late. That is when your Iman will be needed. This is the time right here and now to make sure that our Iman is strong. And people ask, what can I do in light of all that is going on in India, in Kashmir, with the Rohingya, with Syria? And the list goes on and on. I forgot to mention China and the Uyghurs. If I didn't mention that, somebody's going to say, you forgot this group and that group. The list is on and on and on. And every few months, another list comes, another thing comes. Wake up, dear Muslims. Until how long are we going to bury our head in the sand? Things are changing. We need to be prepared. And the way we prepare ourselves first and foremost is the spiritual preparation. We need to have our Iman strong in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said regarding fitan, that I see fitan falling upon you like, like raindrops. And then he said in the same hadith, whoever wants to be saved from the fire of hell and enter Jannah, let death come to him. And his Iman is strong in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, the tragedies of this dunya are indeed painful. Wallahi, every video we see, every picture, our heart bleeds. But those people who were patient and they died that manner, we will be jealous of their maqam on judgment day. We will be jealous of what Allah has blessed them with. And this is not a defeatist attitude. No doubt when a person's physical life is in danger, they will respond back. I'm not telling them to take that. But still those who pass away, those who die, that death of shahada, they will have a reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point is, before that time comes, we can't just sit and ignore. We cannot just pretend as if nothing is happening. And most importantly, we cannot maintain status quo in our laziness with Islam. We cannot maintain status quo with our salah, our zakah, our rituals. The least that we can do is have our heart feel the pain around the globe and then channel that pain to better our own lives, to be better people where we are, to take advantage of the freedoms we have for as long as we have them, to worship more, to be better Muslims. And this leads me to my third point, and that is we channel this iman and taqwa into actual good deeds, into amal al-salih, into rituals and worship. Because nothing increases iman more than actually worshiping Allah. And the linkage between trials and worship is explicit in the tradition as well. Once, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam woke up in the middle of the night. He had seen a dream. And we don't know what was in the dream because he didn't tell us. And he said, what have I seen about what fitan Allah has revealed? He was informed of some fitan coming up in the future. We don't know what it was. Then he woke up to do wudu and pray to hajjud. And then he said, who of his servants is going to go and wake the other wives of mine to pray to hajjud as well? This hadith is in Bukhari. Notice when he saw fitan coming, what was his reaction? When he, when he was told of the impending arrival of trials and tribulations, he stood up in tahajjud. And he told, go and wake up my wives, I want them to pray at tahajjud as well. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, بَادِرُوا بِالْأَعْمَالِ فِتَنًا كَقِطَعَ الْلَيْلِ الْمُظْلِمِ Rush to do good deeds before fitan come like the darkness of the night. Once again, an explicit hadith linking good deeds with fitan, with trials and tribulation. Rush to do good deeds before fitan arrive like like the darkness of the night. The darkness of the night you cannot see. You don't know what's going to happen. Before that happens, make sure you have a stockpile of good deeds. Make sure you've done enough so that inshallah your own iman is strong. You're ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this leads me to my last point. No doubt when it comes to responding to fitan, when it comes to responding to the challenges, Islam does not teach us to turn the other cheek. 
Islam does not teach us to sit down and just take everything that comes to us. No, we do what we can that is reasonable, that is logical, that is within the goals of the Sharia. Ah. And what we should do is something that varies from time to place to culture to society. Let the scholars of every land that have fitan tell their own people what they can and they cannot do. That's something that is up to them to do. But the point I want to make here is that our religion is not a religion of turning the other cheek and we just let fitan come by. No, where we have to, we will do what needs to be done. And even if we die in the process, our Prophet wasallam said, the one who dies defending his honor and the honor of his wife and child, that person is a shaheed. The one who dies defending his family and his property, that person is a shaheed. The purpose of me saying this is very clear. Some people, they say, all we should do is spiritual stuff. Go to the masjid more, worship Allah more. And I am saying that is not the seerah, that is not the sunnah. That is step number one. You make your relationship with Allah strong. No question about it. Step number one, iman, amal, dua, isti'ada. Step number one, you and Allah make that firm. Step number two, do something pragmatic and realistic. Do something. Our Prophet didn't just sit back and do nothing. In Mecca, in Medina, when doing the Hijrah, every single step that he did, there was preparation, there was planning. He actually did something. He took the precautions necessary. He didn't just walk up foolishly and say, Allah will protect me. Allah will protect you if you deserve to be protected. Allah Azza wa Jal will bless you when you take the necessary means. Now, what are the necessary means? As I said, that varies from time to place, to society, to person. We have to preach, we have to talk, we have to educate, we have to spread awareness, we have to form alliances with those who are on the same wavelength as us, as our Prophet ﷺ did. He had no problems forming alliances with Mutam ibn Adi, with others of the noblemen of the Quraysh, his own uncle Abu Talib. Did he say, oh Abu Talib, you're a kafir, I'm not going to take your help? It's not a matter of religion here. Abu Talib wanted justice. Mutab ibn Adi went to justice. These were not Muslims, but they stood up for the protection of Muslims. And the Muslims took advantage of that. And they thanked them for that. And they took that help. And they were hand in hand against those who were wanting injustice. Dear Muslims, if you don't want this evil ideology to rise up even more, the ideology of neo-fascism, of racism, of bigotry, of hatred, of intolerance, then we are the ones at the forefront. Our countries are the ones being banned. Our name is the one being dragged down. Our religion is being smeared. For how long would you be apolitical? It is a part of our religion to stand up and do something. What we should do? I'm not the best person to tell you. Go to the political analysts. Go to those who are experts. But I will tell you as a person who knows the seerah, who has studied the seerah, that this version of Islam that some people follow, that if we just worship Allah, the rest will be fine. That version of Islam is not the version that our Prophet himself followed in his own seerah. That's not how we are Muslims. You don't just sit back and let the Hindu Hindutva come and do what they want. You have to do something, whatever you can. If you are not successful, the movements that you spark might be successful later on. You can't just sit back and ignore. So dear Muslims, we see what is going on in this world today. We cannot be, I don't want to use the word pacifist, that's a bit too harsh, but we cannot just ignore what is going on. We cannot be neutral is a better word. We cannot be politically obtuse. We have to be a little bit more sophisticated and understand that in the seerah of our Prophet Sallallahu Iman and Amal go hand in hand, trust in Allah, and then being proactive in society. This is something that we should be doing. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala protect ourselves and our children from all evil. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless me and you with and through the Quran. And may He make us of those who is verses they understand and implement His halal and haram throughout their lifespan. I ask Allah's forgiveness. You as well ask Him. He is the Ghafoor and the Rahman.